Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Trotman, the Henry Meyer Collegiate Professor of Social Work and co-chair of the Centennial. It's my honor to welcome you to the second of three Centennial Lectures, co-occurring health and mental health conditions. As part of our Centennial celebration, we're excited to bring to you some of the groundbreaking work of our faculty. At this point, I wanna turn it over to our Associate Dean to introduce the panelists. Okay, I'll turn it off, Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Himley. I'm a faculty member here at the School of Social Work and as John said, the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs. Um, today's session provides examples of community engaged and clinic based research uh, focused on multi-level interventions to address co-occurring health and mental health issues. The interactive panel discussion will explore the diversity and promise of social work based research. Now I get to introduce our speakers, which we'll, we'll do all together. First, uh, our discussant for today's uh, session and, um, is Dr. Jamie Mitchell. Uh, Jamie is an associate professor of social work and is a health disparities researcher, extensive experience conducting research on health behaviors, health communication strategies, uh, with the focus of optimizing well being and longevity for African Americans, with a particular emphasis on African American men. Her reach, uh, research uh, focuses on older African American men's preventative health behaviors. Uh, she has a recent NIH R24 grant involving the uh, recruitment and retaining of older African Americans in research. Uh, so most recently, Dr. Mitchell has also taken on a role as a, of assistant director of the clinical research participation uh, of clinical research participation at Michigan Medicine's Robel Cancer Center. So Dr. Mitchell is our discussant. Our first panelist is Dr. Jacqueline Hawkins, an assistant professor at Social Work in the School of Social Work here, Associate Director of the Gender and Health Research Lab. And um, her, Dr. Hawkins' research agenda is focused on social determinants of health behavior in African-Americans and Latinos with diabetes. She's particularly interested in factors that contribute to and uh, to contribute to access as well as utilization of care and diabetes self-management. She's particularly interested in community-based interventions targeting low-income African-American and Latino men. Uh, Dr. Hawkins recently received an NIH R21 grant focused on diabetes self-management for African-American men. Our second panelist is Dr. David Card Cordova. Uh, Dr. Cordova is an associate professor of social work also here at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on uh, Latino health inequities particularly as it relates to the prevention of substance use and HIV in adolescents. Uh, Professor Cordova recently uh, received an early career development award from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to develop and test the efficacy of a family-based drug abuse and HIV in a preventative intervention to be delivered via the internet, which we'll be hearing about later. He's very interested in using community-based participatory research uh, methods, as well as qualitative and longitudinal methodologies to help us understand more about health equities inequities in Latino populations. Next is Professor Brad Zebrak, uh, Professor of Social Work here at the school. His teaching and research interests are in the area of health, medicine, and quality of life. He's particularly interested in the effects of cancer on the psychosocial growth and development of adolescents with and young adults. Um, his funded research also involves evaluation of implementation and psychosocial services in medical care settings. He's uh, recently a new principal investigator on the, an NIH R01 grant focused on genetic mechanisms of health disparities among adolescents and young adults with cancer. Our final presenter is Dr. Anal Zhang. He's an assistant professor at the School of Social Work also here at the University of Michigan. Lots of good intervention researchers happening, uh, research happening here. And he's a clinical research director of the Adolescents and Young Adults Oncology Program at Michigan Medicine. Uh, Dr. Zhang is a health and mental health intervention researcher with a primary interest in psycho-oncology and adolescent and young adult cancer survivorship. Uh, Dr. Zhang is a principal investigator of a grant from Julia's Legacy of Hope 
St. Baldrick's uh, Supportive Care Research Program, evaluating a tailored cognitive behavior therapy for AYA or adolescent young adult cancer patients that you'll be hearing about later today. So that is our panel. So I think we will begin with uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hawkins. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay, so um, my, my name's Jacqueline Hawkins. Um, thank you for inviting me today. I'm excited to talk with you all about my work, um, especially as we celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the UM School of Social Work. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Social Work here at U of M. I also am a graduate of the joint PhD program in social work and sociology. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, I'm the Associate Director of the Curtis Center for Health Equity and Training and the Co-Director of the Pilot and Feasibility Program for the Michigan Center uh, for Diabetes Translational Research. And the title of my presentation today is Program Active, African Americans Coming Together to Increase Vital Exercise, a Combination Physical Activity and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Program. Uh, but before I get started, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement really quickly. Uh, so in the spirit of healing and health, I acknowledge and honor that the University of Michigan resides on the traditional territories of the Three Fires people, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, and that the Great Lakes region remains home to multiple tribal nations. So our agenda for today is uh, I'm going to share some background uh, on the state of African-American men and diabetes and what we know about their health behaviors. Next, I'm going to discuss my current research, including my research on programming for Black men with diabetes and depression. And then I'll just give some concluding remarks. And I look forward to getting everyone's feedback and answering any questions at the end. Right. So my research area is comprised of minority men's mental and physical health, diabetes self-management, and intervention development, adaptation, and testing for this population. So the broader arc of my research right now is fundamentally concerned with the intersection of intervention research for minority men, and specifically adapting existing interventions using implement an implementation science framework. So first I'm gonna go very briefly, um, give you all some background on diabetes, its relationship to mental health, and then I'll discuss briefly the state of research on black men and diabetes self-management. So nationally um, in 2020, about 34.2 million or around 10.5% of the population had diabetes and about 14% of men compared to around 11% uh, to 12% of women had a diabetes diagnosis. And in comparison, the rates are slightly higher in Michigan at about 11%. And the disparities between men and women are slightly lower um, compared to the US as a whole. So in Michigan, 11.5% of men have a diabetes diagnosis versus 10% of women. So for people in the room who may be unfamiliar with diabetes, Diabetes is a condition in which the body does not properly process food for use as, use as energy. So most of the food we eat is turned into glucose or sugar for our bodies to use as energy. And the pancreas, which is an organ that lies near the stomach, makes a hormone called insulin to help, um, to help glucose get into the cells of our body. So when you have diabetes, your body either doesn't make enough insulin, which is type one diabetes, or it can't use its own insulin as well as it should. And that's type two diabetes. This causes sugars to build up in your blood. 
So why am I, you know, talking about type two diabetes and type one and giving you this background? It's to impress upon you that it's a really serious chronic illness. It's a very tough health condition to manage. It can be, um, and it has really severe and serious complications if it's not managed appropriately. Um, so engaging in several diabetes self-management behaviors is critical to living a healthy life with diabetes. And again, why is studying diabetes self-management specifically so important? If it goes unmanaged, it can be life-threatening. So for example, complications from diabetes uh, can lead to health conditions such as diabetic retinopathy, which can impact vision. Uh, also because of the lack of blood flow caused by diabetes, unmanaged diabetes can lead to nerve damage in the feet, amputation, and also kidney issues. Diabetes self-management means a daily adherence to a rigorous routine that's typically defined as checking your blood sugar daily, taking any medications, having a healthy diet, regular exercise, and checking your feet for sores. And these are activities that individuals with diabetes must engage in every day or put themselves at risk for the serious health conditions I just mentioned. I'm gonna take a moment and do a poll. People with type two diabetes cannot eat sweets. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes need to watch their weight and maintain a healthy but balanced diet, but in moderation, right? So as part of a healthy meal plan, desserts, other sugary foods are definitely not off limits. So uh, another motivation for my work and what I'm going to be talking with you all about today oops, is... Um, thinking about diabetes and mental health. So diabetes is associated with a significantly increased prevalence and risk for clinical depression and depressive symptoms. So people with uh, diagnosed with comorbid diabetes and depression frequently exhibit some suboptimal health management, a lower quality of life and increased diabetes related complications than persons with one or the other diagnose only diagnosis only. So even with successful treatment, as many as 80% of patients with diabetes will experience a depression relapse, often leading to a more pronounced expression of depression. Prior studies have reported also that African Americans tend to underutilize mental health services compared to Hispanic whites. So due to the strong association between living with a chronic illness and implications for mental health, in recent years, the American Diabetes Association has called on clinicians and researchers to consider mental health when they're working with people with diabetes. So what this table is describing here is that over the life course, there are psychosocial symptoms and diagnoses you can expect to see in a person with diabetes based on their research so far. And it also highlights the need for both physical and psychosocial care, which means that people with diabetes should not only be seen by physicians and nurses, but also should be interacting regularly with mental health care providers, like social workers, um, who, which are critical in helping people with diabetes, in particular deal with the psychosocial aspects of managing the disease which are just as important as prescriptions and testing and medicine. And that's where my work comes in. How can we utilize existing community infrastructures and mental health care providers like social workers to help people with the diabetes live healthier and happier lives? Uh, but before I get back into the, or get into the exciting intervention step, I should say, I wanna take a step back and talk about the current state of men's health, which is my population of interest. So what we know from the research is that black men face a set of unique risk factors that have a negative impact on diabetes diagnosis rates and health outcomes. 
including age, cultural norms, gender norms, socioeconomic status. And what we know from the research is that Black men are disproportionately more likely to receive a type 2 diabetes diagnosis at later stages of the disease compared to Black women and non-Hispanic white men. We also know that social context and other factors influence the types of masculinity that men construct and may be similar, but also different in important ways for African-American men. And we know from the research that this construction can sometimes negatively influence their diabetes self-management and their interactions with care. And lastly, we know that there's a lack of research for both African-American men uh, related to diabetes self-management um, and uh, mental health care use. So I've published several articles that provide a foundation for studying diabetes in African-American men. And I've looked closely at both psychosocial and gender related factors and how they impact diabetes self-management in this population. But for the sake of time, um, I won't go into detail about these studies. Uh, the one that I will mention is a review that I did a few years ago um, with a couple of colleagues. And we found after looking at diabetes self-management interventions from the last 20 years, that black men who participated in that research were on average only 15% of the sample. So in our existing research um, re on African-Americans related to diabetes self-management, black men are underrepresented. So next I'm gonna go over next steps in my research. Uh, with a specific focus on my intervention research that was heavily informed by my previous work. Um, I also want to say, you know, I'm just going to go discuss this intervention really briefly, but I'm happy to talk more about it with folks who are interested. Uh, so I'm presently the PI on two pilot studies, and the overarching goals of both of the studies are to improve health outcomes for Black men with diabetes. And my work focuses on the consistent evidence um, a failure to translate research findings into clinical practice. I utilize the field of implementation science, whose goal is to study determinants, processes, and outcomes of implementation uh, of evidence-based interventions. So I'm present, presently conducting two studies. The first is a peer leader diabetes self-management support intervention that's funded by NIH. And the second, which I'll be talking with you about today, is a physical activity and cognitive behavioral therapy intervention. Uh, and that is a pilot study that was funded by the Michigan Center for Diabetes Translational Research and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. All right. So, um, I'm going to present on, on things a little differently. Um, while most folks tend to present results, I'd, I'd like to talk with you all today about a study in its earlier stages. Um, so in terms of specific aims, the first specific aim involved adapting an existing intervention in collaboration with Black men with type 2 diabetes. So we propose to adapt an evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy and physical activity intervention called Program Active originally. Um, and at the active stands for adults coming together to increase vital exercise. And the second specific aim is to conduct a pilot randomized controlled trial of this adapted intervention to evaluate participant recruitment and retention rates, how satisfied men were with the intervention, of course, the impact of the intervention um, on our primary outcomes, which were depressive symptoms and glycemic control or um, HbA1c, and also to assess the impact of the intervention on our secondary outcomes, which were diabetes social support and diabetes self-management behaviors. So, uh, my proposed intervention is based on program active, like I mentioned, and the goal of program active originally was to assess the comparative effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy and exercise to usual care. 
on depression and A1C outcomes. That program was originally conducted in rural Appalachia and um, also in an urban underserved environment, uh, all with folks with type two diabetes. And it involved 10 individual counseling sessions and 12 weeks of community-based exercise. So in terms of my adapt adaptation, we're still going to have um, all the aspects I just mentioned. However, there's gonna be some important changes. So our intervention is going to focus obviously on African-American men. Um, it's gonna be based in Detroit. And due to the documented impact of gender norms, thank you, Emma, <laughs> of gender norms on diabetes self-management and health behaviors in general, um, we also included a gender norm scale in, the, in our study questionnaires. And of course, we're going to be incorporating ways to overcome the barriers that we identify to physical activity and mental health care use in the pre-implementation phase. So I just wanted to say really quick, you know, why, why CBT combined with physical activity specifically? In the previous two inter, uh, iterations of Program Active, depression remission among the participants um, what in, the, in the intervention group was five to six times more likely. And they sustained gains, uh, or rather not gains, but improvement in their A1C over 12 months. So after the program concluded, folks in the intervention group had really great improvements in their blood sugar. Um, and when we checked, or when the PI, the original PI checked in with folks 12 months later, they had sustained those improvements in their A1C. So we know it works, but how can we get black men with type two diabetes involved in a program like this? That's very effective and beneficial. So um, that's where program active with an extra A comes in, in my work. Uh, what we're proposing to do is to give all of the participants a nutrition education program. We're going to randomize them to enhance usual care. So they're gonna receive referrals to community mental health providers and pedometers if they're in the control group. Um, in the first phase, we're gonna do two focus groups with black men with type two diabetes. And the purpose of those focus groups is to assess barriers and facilitators to mental health care use and exercise and also to get their opinions on the feasibility and acceptability of these intervention materials. Uh, our second phase will be to randomize to use the enhanced usual care, and then also to randomize folks to the combination CBT and exercise intervention. And again, that's 10 individual sessions, and those are given in my study by licensed clinical social workers and they get 12 weeks of community-based exercise. And those are six, six of those classes are led by personal trainers. Um, originally in the study also, we had partnerships with the Northwest Activity Center in the city of Detroit and the Detroit Community Health Connection, which uh, is a federally qualified health center in Detroit. All right. So the last thing I'll mention the last couple of slides here is uh, while the intervention itself is 12 weeks, we're conducting this study uh, with a three month assessment period to see if men were able to sustain any gains they had during the program. Uh, our data is gonna be collected at three time points, baseline three months at the conclusion of the intervention. And lastly, we're gonna collect, like I mentioned, three months post intervention. And this is uh, below is just an example of what the men need to do each week for the intervention. Uh, these are some of the study measures that we're gonna be collecting. Um, obviously we're gonna be asking folks to come in, we're gonna get their biometrics. Um, during the course of the intervention, we ask them to keep a physical activity diary. Everyone gets a pedometer um, and we get everyone's, like I, like I said, biometrics. So these are the last slides, I promise. Um, so here's a poll. 
People with diabetes can feel when their sugar levels are high or low. False. Um, you may feel certain symptoms like weakness or fatigue if your blood sugar levels are low or high, but the only way to know your blood sugar levels for sure is to test them. So people who don't test regularly may have blood sugar levels that are high enough to damage the body without them even realizing it. So I just wanna conclude with some questions to consider. Um, as we move forward with doing this intervention, some things that have come up is, you know, what's the best way to recruit and retain populations that typically do not participate in research and also have fewer interactions with healthcare? And the second question that we are grappling with is, what other existing community infrastructures might we utilize to help sustain the program in the long term? And that's it. I just want to thank everyone for coming today, and I look forward to discussing. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Cordova, and I am faculty in the School of Social Work. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit today about our program of research that's focused on reducing substance use and sexual risk behaviors and enhancing HIV and STI testing among youth. So just to tell you a little bit about uh, the background of our program of research and the significance, youth here on defined as adolescents and emerging adults, 14 to 21 years of age, are in a developmental period that can be characterized, among other things, of enhanced vulnerability. And particularly uh, what we're interested in here is, is the youth disproportionately engaged in many risk behaviors that are enhance their vulnerability to mortality and morbidity. So for example, national surveillance data from the Monitoring the Future study indicate that youth engage in many substance use behaviors. And so the most widely used licit and illicit substance use behaviors include alcohol use and marijuana use. In addition, when we look at data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, many youth also engage in condomless sex at last sexual intercourse. Given that substance use and condomless sex are risk behaviors for both STIs and HIV infection, it should not be surprising then that youth are disproportionately impacted by STI and HIV infection. In fact, despite accounting for nearly 25% of the sexually active population, youth accounted for nearly 50% of all new STI infections in the previous year. In addition, youth accounted for 25% of all new HIV infections. Despite the high prevalence of substance use and sexual risk behaviors and STI and HIV infection, STI and HIV testing, a National Institutes of Health research priority, remain relatively low among youth. In fact, only 9% of youth report having ever been tested for HIV in their lifetime. In addition, many youth are not routinely screened for asymptomatic STIs as recommended by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And yet relatively few interventions have been developed to enhance the uptake of HIV and STI testing and prevent and reduce substance use and sexual risk behaviors among youth. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to examine the preliminary efficacy of storytelling for empowerment in enhancing the uptake of HIV and STI testing across the trial 
and reducing substance use and sexual risk behaviors at three and six months among youth. So here we have our first poll question, which I believe Emma will be placing up. So storytelling for empowerment is theory driven and informed by eco-developmental and empowerment framework. So from an eco-developmental perspective, youth are embedded in interrelated and interconnected contexts that both shape the youth and are shaped by the youth over time. And so our research and that of others have demonstrated the utility of an eco-developmental framework to inform family-based interventions with a particular focus on enhancing parent and youth communication. In the present study, however, we focus on the uh, clinic microsystem with the opportunity to focus on clinician youth communication. In addition, from an empowerment perspective, youth have the necessary tools and resources and strengths and so here we have an opportunity to link them with important adult figures, such as clinicians, to reinforce and to enhance some of those strengths. And so a little bit about the storytelling for empowerment intervention. So this is an adaptation of a best practice that's registered with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and has demonstrated in the face-to-face -face version uh, effectiveness at preventing and reducing substance use and sexual risk behaviors among youth. And so applying the principles of community-based participatory research in conjunction with NIDA prevention principles, we adapted the storytelling for empowerment intervention into a web-based mobile health app. And so both youth and clinicians were involved in the adaptation process and informed all the decision-making processes of the research from the submission of the proposal to the dissemination of findings. And so here, for example, youth were involved in uh, developing the user interface and the user experience of this mobile health app. So they, through an iterative process, selected the colors, selected the landing page, selected the content and the process of this web-based app. And so S4E consists of an assessment, a risk assessment, followed by modules that focus on sexual risk behaviors, substance use, and HIV and STI testing. And so when youth in interact with this web-based app, they first complete a risk assessment that's focused on substance use, sexual risk, and HIV and STI testing practices. Following this assessment, youth then are provided with targeted and tailored content. So for example, if during the risk assessment, youth endorse uh, substance use behaviors such as marijuana use and having engaged in condomless sex, then youth are, are recommended an initial five videos and interactive content. And then in addition, there's an additional 40 videos and interactive content that were also youth identified and developed that the youth can also engage uh, with throughout the duration of the app. And so, um, as I mentioned, the app consists of, uh, inter of storytelling scenario videos. And so here we develop characters that resonate with youth and place them in real world uh, settings and contexts that reflect some of the situations that uh, youth discuss during the formative research. Beyond the, inter the storytelling uh, videos, Youth also helped to develop uh, interactive content, including, for example, here, the, the characters. Um, in here, they're able to touch on their mobile device um, different uh, parts of the body to see, for example, the effects of substances on various parts of the body. 
So beyond the youth facing app, we also developed a clinician facing app that communicates uh, synchronously with, with the youth facing app. And so here we interviewed clinicians who informed us that their clinic's uh, risk assessment wasn't doing a very good job of flagging the specific risk behaviors. And also many were very lengthy. And so we streamlined this uh, risk assessment and <clears throat> more easily uh, flagged the specific risk behaviors for the clinician. And so what this did was facilitate a clinician initiated risk reduction encounter where clinicians can then focus in on the specific risk behaviors that the youth re reported, uh, which then allows them to provide targeted and tailored prevention services. In addition, we also provided the clinicians with a resource toolkit. Again, this is based on the youth risk responses where the clinician can then not only reinforce specific prevention messaging, but also link the youth to important prevention services in the local community, such as free HIV and STI testing and substance use prevention services. And so now that Storytelling for Empowerment um, has demonstrated high feasibility, acceptability, um, and preliminary efficacy at 30 days post baseline. In the present study, we hypothesized that relative to the control condition, participants in the S4E condition would uh, see an enhanced uptake of both HIV and STI testing across the trial. In addition, we hypothesized that relative to the control condition, participants in the S4E condition would report greater reductions in both condomless sex and substance use behaviors at three and six months post baseline. Although um, given the preliminary efficacy nature of our study, we didn't do any formal mediation analysis. Uh, we did test changes in our potential mechanisms of change, namely youth clinician communication, um, as well as self-efficacy refusal skills. And given the preliminary uh, efficacy nature of our study, we de-emphasized significance testing. And rather our purpose here was to establish the necessary parameters to inform a future randomized control trial. So a little bit about the study design. We recruited 100 participants in the current trial. And to be eligible for this um, study, participants had to be between the ages of 14 to 21, um, uh, be sexually, sexually active, defined as having had oral, vaginal, or anal sex in the past six months. And that was because our primary outcomes were HIV and STI testing. Um, and then also ha report having access to a mobile device, as well as report not um, having any tentative or firm plans to move out of Southeast Michigan. And so participants were randomized and then assessed at baseline um, and then reassessed at three and six months post baseline. And notably at six months post baseline, we had a 95% retention rate. And so a little bit about our participants. Um, we recruited a diverse sample of youth, 44% reported as non-Hispanic white, 38% as African-American, 5% Hispanic, uh, with a mean age of approximately 19 years of age, 25% uh, were um, less than 18 years of age, and approximately 66% identified as female. So here's another poll question. Okay, so with respect to HIV and STI testing, relative to control group, participants in the S4E group 
reported a higher uptake of both HIV and STI testing across the trial, and this produced uh, a small effect size. With respect to uh, past 90 day condomless sex, participants, I'm sorry, my participants, um, relative to the control group, participants in the S4E group um, reported greater reductions in past 90 day condomless sex at both three and six months post baseline. With respect to past 90 day marijuana use, participants, relative to participants in the control group, participants in the S4E group reported greater reductions at three and six months post baseline. And, um, both participants in the S4E and control group reported a 10% reduction at six months post baseline in past 90 day alcohol use. And so then we um, examined the potential mechanisms of change of our intervention. And both youth and clinicians in the S4E group reported high, a higher level of youth clinician communication relative to both youth and clinician in the control group. And this produced a, a large effect size. Additionally, relative to youth in the control group, youth in the S4E group reported um, a larger increase in self-efficacy refusal skills at six months post baseline. And so our findings suggest that S4E demonstrated preliminary efficacy, particularly in enhancing uh, the uptake of HIV and STI, test, STI testing across the trial, as well as reducing condomless sex and marijuana use past 90 days um, at three and six months post baseline. Contrary to what we hypothesized, participants in both the S4E and control groups uh, reported uh, similar reductions in alcohol use. And so it may be that uh, perhaps S4E doesn't have an effect on, on alcohol use uh, or in line with NIDA prevention principles, we may need to enhance the content and also incorporate some booster sessions that focus on alcohol prevention messaging. Um, in addition, um, participants in the S4E group also reported um, higher increases in uh, the potential mechanisms of change, namely clinician youth communication and self-efficacy. And so this is an important advancement um, in the scientific knowledge of mobile health interventions, especially given that relatively few have identified potential mechanisms of change on substance use and sexual risk outcomes. So findings show the promise of S4E, particularly in the areas of HIV and STI testing and on um, substance use outcomes, and um, indicate that perhaps maybe a larger efficacy trial may be warranted. The study findings, however, should be interpreted in light of several limitations. Um, First, um, you know, this is conducted at one youth-centered community health clinic and is not representative of uh, the entire clinic population nor the U.S. Um, general youth population. And so this limits the generalizability. In addition, um, we relied on self-report measures. And although researchers um, have shown the reliance of self-report measures, future research may want to also incorporate some biomarkers in future research. And then finally, um, this study also recruited participants who are currently seeking services at a clinic. And so we may be missing um, a very um, vulnerable population and those youth who are currently not in services. And so future research may work to, um, to engage and recruit participants who are currently not seeking services. 
Nonetheless, um, the present study uh, plays an important role in advancing the scientific knowledge on mobile health interventions and the potential impact that they have on preventing and reducing substance use, sexual risk behaviors, and enhancing HIV and STI testing among a vulnerable population. Thank you. All right, I take it I'm good to go. People out there, hello? You're good to go. Sure, go ahead. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, hi everybody, good afternoon, good morning to you wherever you may be. Uh, I'm Brad Zebrak, professor here in the School of Social Work. Um, and uh, first, just want to start by expressing my gratitude for the invitation to uh, take part in this 100 year anniversary of the School of Social Work, which has played a big role in my um, education, first as a, a, a doctoral student in the Joint Program in Social Work and Sociology, uh, and now having been on faculty here at the University of Michigan for the past 13 years. Uh, I'm going to start you off with my poll question. Uh, so Emma, you can go ahead and post that up, and I'll actually take a little, take a pause for a few seconds and give folks a chance to um, answer here. Um, I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about support, uh, cancer support um, uh, for people affected by cancer. So, uh, who is it that provides psychological and supportive care for cancer patients and their families? Is it nurses? Is it physicians? Is it social workers? Or is it all of the above? There we go. Um, most of you did sort of catch that this was a little bit of a trick question. Um, it is true um, that all of these folks uh, do provide support to cancer patients and their families. And I'm having a little trouble advancing my slides here. There we go. Um, and yet, even though that all these providers do provide support um, and care to some extent, um, I would argue that social workers are the only professionals who are specifically trained um, uh, and skilled to facilitate access to the services and the resources that are required uh, to respond to the full range of needs expressed by patients and families affected by cancer. Uh, social workers are the most knowledgeable in terms of the evidence base, uh, and they're most skilled to implement the effective um, and evidence-based interventions within clinical care. And they're also oriented to issues of equity and justice in their education and, and training. So in my presentation today, I'm not necessarily focusing on a specific intervention. I'm really making the argument that social workers are critical interventionists um, in optimizing care for people affected by cancer, as well as for achieving equity and addressing the disparities, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, first, a little bit of background on cancer and, and really who was affected here in the United States. Um, the lifetime incidence of cancer uh, for um, adults in the United States is one in two males and one in three females. So in essence, uh, one, in, one out of every two males are expected to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime, and one in, point, one in three females are expected. Uh, and you could see that if and when diagnosed with cancer, these are the, the three leading um, types of cancer uh, that both males and females would, uh, would or could be diagnosed with, uh, as well as the leading cause of death when cancer is the cause of death. Uh, you could see that pretty much both uh, males and females, lung cancer, um, followed by prostate cancer for men and breast cancer for um, uh, females and colorectal cancer are the leading causes of death. So in essence, everybody in this country at some point in their life will know somebody with cancer. 
And for the last 60 years or so, um, malignant neoplasms, which is cancer, uh, along with heart disease, uh, have been the two leading causes of death uh, for citizens in the United States, uh, accounting for about 44% of all deaths. This is data from 2017. Um, these figures have um, uh, been a slightly decrease in, in, in terms of numbers of death, absolute numbers of death uh, deaths over the last a uh, few years, but have pretty much uh, been steady um, since 2017. What I do want to point out, given that we've all now been through about a year and a half worth of, of uh, the COVID um, uh, virus, um, in one year, ranging from 2020 to 2021, COVID has, um, with over 500,000 deaths, uh, can be um, uh, identified as the third leading cause of death in the United States over the last year, following cancer and, and heart disease. Now, some people have tried to argue um, that given that people with chronic conditions such as heart disease or cancer are then most likely to be the ones that um, uh, died uh, with uh, their deaths attributable to COVID, that perhaps those numbers for cancer and, and, and heart disease would actually be lower you know, again, given if folks, if they've moved from cancer or heart disease as the cause of their death to COVID, um, that, uh, that those numbers would decrease. But in fact, what we see, and from data reported by the CDC, that actually the opposite is true. Um, that given COVID, we've actually seen an increase in the excess deaths um, attributable to cancer. So in 2020, uh, if you're looking at this, uh, this bar chart um, here for both colorectal cancer and breast cancer, um, colorectal cancer and breast cancer, we saw about 500 to 600 more deaths than we would have uh, had COVID not occurred in this country. And what we're seeing projected over the next 10 years are actually increases in the projected rates of death attributable to colorectal cancer or breast cancer because of COVID. And the explanations that have been provided is that COVID has led to a lot of other pressures within our healthcare system, which has, which has um, contributed to delays in diagnosis. We know that early detection and prevention is one of the key ways of preventing morbidity and mortality due to cancer. But because of COVID, we've seen many delays in diagnosis. Uh, we've also seen interruptions or alterations in treatment regimen. Folks showing up to the hospital or not even going to the clinic for their chemotherapy or their radiation because those spaces within hospitals have been taken up by people who have COVID uh, and need that, that kind of attention. The loss of employment as well as the associated loss of health insurance has minimized, uh, has led to a decrease in access to care. Again, without that, that key, without that health insurance key to get in to see a doctor, um, that's gonna contribute to delays um, and further contribute to these risks of, of morbidity and mortality due to cancer. We've also seen decreases in practices of preventive care. We've seen increases in smoke. of this excess rate of death attributable to cancer and influenced by COVID-19. Um, and the, the, the federal government. And she conceptualized cancer as not just a disease process with associated medical treatment, but also a succession of social interactions and psychological conditions that accompany, uh, including um, uh, 
Holland and Roland who have uh, date back to some of the original founders of this notion of integrating the psychological and social aspects uh, of, of life into cancer care. Um, they've identified these five different domains in which people are, lives are disrupted or affected um, uh, when, uh, when impacted by cancer. Um, sometimes referred to as the five Ds, um, this first in terms of distance, cancer impacts on, on uh, distance between in relationships, altering interpersonal relationships. Um, there's disfigurement, the experience of body image or sexual image and, and integrity of the physical body. People feel that um, uh, in their uh, the effects of cancer in their body. It's disabling. Uh, including a, a disabling of, of people who, who in their life, their life goals and, and dreams that they have for their future, uh, regardless of however old they might be, um, they experience those disruptions when cancer strikes. Um, they're oftentimes forced into dependence on others. Um, yeah, um, um, you know, living, wanting, perhaps desiring to live independent lives, and yet oftentimes then having to require uh, help from others, being positioned to have to ask for help from others uh, can be a very challenging and uncomfortable position for folks. And then of course, confronting one's own mortality uh, when diagnosed with cancer. So the, the psychological and emotional fallout uh, that occurs alongside the, the biology and the, the treatment for cancer are really key and critical to attend to. And, and I would argue that this is really the domain for, for social work in cancer care. There have also been conceptualization, uh, conceptualizations of cancer as being experienced uh, as psychological trauma. Um, here you can see some, some uh, theoretical uh, presentations, particularly by George Bonanno, uh, well-known in the field of psychology and trauma. Um, well, he has theorized that when, when folks are exposed to trauma, uh, they might follow one of four different trajectories over a period of time. Uh, that for some people, and if you look at that line there at the top of this, this bar chart, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, top of this graph, line graph, you'll see that um, for some people at, the, at their experience of trauma, their psychological response, their, 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 their psychological social functioning is severely impacted. And that over time, um, that impact uh, remains severe over time. And he has labeled that a chronic, a chronic trajectory of trauma. Um, the second line, which begins that dashed line and then, and then decreases over time, that some people at that exposure to trauma experience perhaps moderate levels of distress at the time of exposure, but then recover over time, assumedly because they have access to either intrapersonal, interpersonal, community-based resources uh, that play a key role in, in, in their emotional or psychological recovery over time. Uh, for others who may experience a moderate, le moderate level of distress at the time of exposure, um, that, that level may actually increase over time and is labeled a delayed trajectory. And there may be, again, other environmental social factors uh, that come into play uh, that increase the likelihood that these folks will actually increase in their levels of distress over time after being exposed to that trauma. And then finally is a subset of, group of folks following what's called a resilience trajectory that they have they, they presumably have intrapersonal and, and environmental resources available to them at the time of their exposure to trauma, which may minimize that, uh, their emotional response to that trauma and, and, and remains um, within somewhat of a mild uh, trajectory over time. So I was interested in testing whether or not this, this model actually applied uh, to teenagers and young adults in, uh, impacted by cancer, a population that I've been interested in, uh, both as a clinician working in the field of pediatric oncology uh, as a social worker, and then making this the, the focus of my uh, academic research. And in fact, in our in our uh, in a longitudinal study of 152 adolescent and adult cancer patients, uh, we did find over time that. Um, the, that subgroups did follow these different trajectories. So you can see here uh, that uh, in terms of a chronic trajectory, 11.8%, uh, almost 12% of our sample 
remained um, uh, at, at a significant, uh, clinically significant levels of distress over time. Another 15% of them followed that delayed trajectory, uh, about just under 20% followed that recovery trajectory, and about half um, followed a resilience trajectory. And then to the right in the other column, you can see there was a, a comparable study published in the literature that did a similar work with adult uh, patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And again, found a subset of folks following in both the chronic, the delayed, the recover, and the resilience uh, trajectories. And I think this, this work is, is, um, is meaningful and significant, particularly today in an era where you hear discussions around what's called precision medicine. Um, the ability to identify uh, or detect um, or predict which, which folks are gonna be most significantly impacted in, in negative ways by their condition uh, so that we can really focus our resources um, uh, on those folks who are at the highest risk and then uh, titrate or, or moderate or modify uh, the attention given to others um, based on the times, uh, time points at which they might express, express a need. Um, within the cancer field, regardless of type of cancer diagnosed, regardless of the age of the, the sample in the study, we've seen consistent findings of anywhere from 30 to 40% of people diagnosed with cancer uh, demonstrate symptoms of psychological distress, uh, which could be attributable to uh, symptoms of depression or anxiety. They may be a function of, of, um, uh, of tension in, in relationships, intimate relationships. Uh, there may be other challenges in, in the home, in the family uh, that, are, that are contributing to their distress and, and may subsequently serve uh, as impediments or barriers to accessing or receiving um, uh, optimal care. So in terms of the role that, psych, uh, that social workers play within the, 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 the domain of cancer care, um, the Institute of Medicine has defined psychosocial services as the psychological and social services or interventions that enable patients, their families, and healthcare providers to optimize biomedical care and manage the psychological, behavioral, social aspects of illness and its consequences. The point here is that managing the psychological and social impact is, is equally as important to the provision of the, the biomedical care because without attending to the barriers of care, what good is the chemotherapy? What good is the, the, the medical intervention if folks can't get there, if folks can't optimize their, um, their access, utilization, and benefit of that treatment? And if we look at, at, at psychosocial, the, the research in this field, um, since the 1970s, the first, those are the first empirical studies of psychological and social impact of cancer, identifying these domains in which social workers practice. Um, but then by around 2008, a, a landmark study by the Institute of Medicine came out uh, looking at the extent to which psychological and supportive care was being made available uh, to patients and families and the extent that, the, that they were benefiting from that. And they reported that most folks in need were also the least likely to get those needs met. Um, and then some work in 2016, looking at the uh, organizational structures uh, the resources across cancer centers in the United States, there was an uneven and unequal capacity. Um, some centers across the country were very highly resourced, uh, had, had very well-established ratios of social workers to patients, uh, whereas on the other end, uh, there were some uh, centers that were really doing you know, poorly uh, in terms of having resources, uh, including social workers available uh, for their patient population. Um, I want to finish up in the last few minutes by introducing an emerging scientific area, uh, one that I've been pretty interested and excited about, uh, that also aligns with uh, contemporary attention to social determinants of health and looking at the upstream factors that contribute to um, uh, downstream needs, and particularly in the field of cancer. I've always been intrigued by Sarah Gellert's work. Um, in which she has posed this question about trying to get an understanding of how the, the environment gets under people's skin to literally affect their health outcomes and then disparities in those outcomes. 
Um, and if we look at the way that cancer treatments have evolved over the years, we can kind of see and recognize the ecological context that has driven not only the biomedical approach to cancer treatment, but also the psychosocial care. I think most folks are, are under, understand the, the notion that chemotherapy, literally chemicals that are injected into people's bodies as a way to attack cancer cells. Uh, cancer cells are are mutating genes, they're, they're, they're genes that are replicating out of control. And the purpose of the chemotherapy is in essence to stop that, um, that reproduction of those, of those um, uh, mutating genes. Um, but we've, we've made advances uh, primarily due to the advances in, in, in genetics and genomics where we're now understanding that those cancer cells exist within it sort of, if we're thinking ecologically here, the microbiome, those cancer cells are living in a neighborhood of other cells. And some of those other cells feed those mutating cells, feed those cancer cells. So the next level of, of, of treatment evolved to, to start thinking about, well, maybe if we, if we also can target the neighborhood of those cancer cells, perhaps starve off the, the energy to those cancer cells, that could become another viable way of treatment. And we've seen that evolution in, in cancer treatment over the years, attacking or addressing the microbiome. But that microbiome exists within a next level of, of uh, concentric circle or context, which is the immune system. And today we've seen emerging therapies, particularly Gleevec for those folks diagnosed with uh, particular levels of, of types of uh, leukemia and lymphoma, uh, as well as the emergence of immunotherapies, CAR-T um, being one of the more um, recent um, uh, inventions here that, that target the immune system, uh, recognizing that the immune system operating uh, uh, can affect both that microbiome, that neighborhood of the cancer cells, as well as the cancer cells themselves. And that the immune system can be observed in terms of a genetic profile. And this whole basis now for precision medicine really has to do with identifying biomarkers, being able to, to look at a gene profile and, and, and look at its association with the function of the immune system and then be able to assign a particular immunotherapy that will be responsive to the genes that are being activated um, in this particular case. So when we hear about searches for biomarkers, this is what our biomedical scientists are trying to do. They're trying to look at a, at, at a gene profile and use it as a way to predict which patients are more or less likely to respond to a particular um, a particular therapy. Well, again, moving on, thinking conceptually, those, those biomarkers, our genes, are responsive to the brain. The brain is the conductor of gene activation. It's the conductor of our, our entire bodily function. And we know that the, that the brain is susceptible to stresses, uh, to hormonal stimulation, um, and these are the things that come from our social environment. Thus, we're making the connection. And here we use an example, tamoxifen therapy um, uh, for women diagnosed and treated for breast cancer are often put on uh, tamoxifen afterwards as a way to um, sustain or maintain brain function, CNS function in order to influence gene function, which then leads to um, controls of, of physiology, of bodily uh, systems and bodily functions. So what I'm doing here is saying that if, if all of this is then being driven by the brain and we know the brain confident to engage in their own care, um, even their, 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 their psychological set, their intention to uh, attribute meaning or have a sense of purpose in life uh, related to cancer. Um, this is the domain of social work, and this is where we can play a key role 
um, in in responding and um, and uh, complementing uh, treatments for cancer. Um, this is um, where things are at today. This is I just probably tried to cram in a whole semester's worth of of biology in a short twenty. It looks like Brad might be having some trouble with the uh, camera, but I think he was just about to end up. So I think what we'll do is we'll move on to an now. Uh, looks like we have a poll question. We'll move on to Dr. Zhang, and then there'll be a chance later for Dr. Zebrak to uh, answer some questions. Thanks a ton, Brad. Really great. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, if, if you can, okay, cool. All right, let me restart my timer. Okay, um, good day, everyone. It is really a pleasure having the chance to share with you some of the work that I have been led in collaboration with my colleagues from UM School of Social Work, Michigan Medicine, in supporting the complex psychosocial needs among adolescent and young adult AYAs diagnosed with cancer. My name is Anao John. I am an assistant professor at the UM School of Social Work. Um, it's always nice to do a cancer-related presentation following Brad Zebrak, just because he lays such a nice ground and foundation um, for the important context of psychosocial care for cancer survivors. And in, in this case, I wanted to argue that for AYA. AYA is an age-defined population with cancer between the age of 15 to 39 years old, which includes three distinct developmental stages, which are mid to late adolescence, those 15 to 18 years old, emergent adulthood, 18 to 25 years old, and the young adulthood, which is 26 to 39 years old. And throughout their cancer journey, AYAs with cancer are continuously confronted with multiple stressors, including invasive curative treatment options that are often painful and burdensome for them. The immediate treatment symptoms and side effects, such as nausea, insomnia, and significant changes in one's appearance. Also, there is a long-term and an often irreversible impact on AYA's fertility capacity, lung or heart health, health, et cetera. And of course, there are many unique psychosocial challenges that are specifically belonging to the AYA population, which includes uncle fertility, financial toxicity, sexual health, just to name a few. And many of these have long term and lifelong implication for the wellness of AYAs diagnosed with cancer. So when combined, all these factors put AYA with cancer at significantly higher risk of experiencing psychological distress, especially depression and anxiety. So before we start the first poll, I wanna provide you the context and then we'll do the poll. So according to the National Institute of Mental Health and data from the 2019 NACDUH uh, data set, there is an estimated 7.8% of the U.S. adults, the general adult population, 7.8% of them experience depression. So the poll question here is, what is the estimated rate of depression among adolescents and young adults with cancer? Brad kind of has already uh, allured to that idea a little bit. We know it's definitely higher than the general population, but I will just give everyone maybe 10 seconds trying to uh, you know, putting in your thoughts with regard to the, the prevalence rate of depression among AYAs diagnosed with cancer. All right, you can keep voting, but I'm going to give you out the answer. The answer is 25%. So while there exists no rigorous data to systematically evaluate the rate of depression among AYAs diagnosed with cancer, existing studies estimated the prevalence rate of depression among AYAs with cancer ranged between 16 to 42%, with a recent meta-analysis estimating an overall prevalence rate of 25% AYA survivors having depressive symptoms. Um, we have a next poll. Um, and uh, we can pull out the point and I'm going to read out the question, right? So for me as a clinical social worker, my immediate, I, I would immediately start to wonder now. So we know that depressive symptom is highly prevalent among AYAs, 
But when com do we have evidence-based interventions for us to support this population? And the question here is when compared with interventions for pediatric cancer survivors, psychosocial interventions for psychological outcomes among AYA survivors are equally effective, more effective than the pediatric cancer survivors, less effective than, or the evidence remain inconclusive. So our team recently published the meta-analysis in the journal Critical Reviews in Oncology, Hematology. We looked across 61 clinical trials of supportive interventions for pediatric and AYA cancer survivors. And one of the key findings, unfortunately for me as an AYA cancer researcher, was that on average, psychosocial and supportive treatments effect was significantly lower among AYA cancer survivors than their pediatric counterparts who are diagnosed with cancer. This means that although we know efficacious depressive treatments are available for AYAs in general, meaning most of those without cancer, such as cognitive behavior therapy, when it comes to deliver research-supported treatments like CBT to AYA cancer survivors, these interventions are not as effective as they stand now. And published studies have found that CBT is only effective for AYA cancer survivors when first the treatment option is available and easily accessible to the population. And more importantly, when AYA cancer survivors are compliant, engaged and cooperative with available treatment and options. Both sets of requirement, however, have not been successfully, or at least to my knowledge, actualized in the real world practices of psychosocial oncology supporting AYAs with depression. First, um, I think it doesn't come as a surprise that CBT is often not easily available or accessible to AYAs with cancer, mimicking the pattern of mental health professional workforce shortage nationally and internationally, studies have consistently reported additional factors that contribute to the mental health workforce shortage in psychosocial oncology supporting AYAs, one factor being the required expertise to address mental health conditions comorbid with cancer. And even for those NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers, such as Michigan Medicine, that have certain level of mental health resources and workforce available, a wait list is often long, between usually between one to three months, and not all providers are fully trained in delivering evidence-based therapeutic intervention, such as cognitive behavior therapy. And with recent advances in computer and mobile technologies, tech-assisted CBTs, TCBTs, have been found as a promising solution to reduce the access barriers facing many AYA cancer survivors in need of mental health support. With that said, however, although tech-assisted CBTs, TCBTs, are highly promising in addressing access barriers, most programs um, are academically oriented and text heavy and does not engage clients effectively. In addition to our knowledge, there exists no TCBT that specifically is designed to meet the unique medical and psychosocial challenges confronting AYAs diagnosed with cancer, leaving a major gap in the AYA psycho-oncology literature. So taken all together, our team identified four key areas of improvement that are needed to address depression among AYAs diagnosed with cancer. First, it is important to integrate cancer-specific disease management and educational content into TCBT treatment to ensure content relevance. Second, it is critical to be innovative, to create fun and uh, engaging treatment content that are attractive to AYA cancer survivors, a younger population that is known to be difficult to engage in the therapeutic process. Third, it is also important to accommodate visual materials that are aesthetically appealing and developmentally attractive to AYA populations, including and specific, especially for those who are traditionally underserved, like racial and ethnic minority AYA cancer survivors. And finally, it is critical to consider platform-based based tailoring features that are easy, flexible, and allow low-cost 
uh, tailoring to maximize individualized treatment options and maximize treatment uptake. The program that I'm sharing with you all today is, highly pro is a highly promising platform that simultaneously meets many of, if not all of the areas that were mentioned in the previous slide. The program is called Mind Your Total Health, the MYTH program, which was named by a group of young adult cancer survivors who overwhelmingly expressed their preferences of not having the word cancer in the naming of the program and also found somewhat the acronym MYTH being cool. The MYTH program is an AYA cancer-specific TCBT program that is tailored based on its parent program, Entertain Me Well, which was co-developed by doctors Addie Weaver and Joe Himley with support from the National Institute of Mental Health. And for those of you who attended the first lecture series, Dr. Weaver shared her work delivering the Ross program to rural residents with depression and is a sister program with the MYTH program. Inheriting many strengths of the parent program, the MYTH program engages its user with a retrospective engaging storyline and include most sessions ending with a cliffhanger to boost treatment compliance. In addition, MYTH utilizes platform-based tailoring features from Entertain You All and thoroughly modify those educational and motivational panels for developmental, medical, and the psychosocial needs of AY cancer survivors, which I will further elaborate just in a minute. But first and foremost, MYTH contains core therapeutic components of CBT interventions, including cognitive restructuring, behavior activation, and problem solving. Although platform-based tailoring features are available in the MYTH platform, those contents related to core CBT fidelity, including the order of delivering certain content are locked in a sense uh, and cannot be easily changed to ensure pro program and treatment fidelity. When we are tailoring the program, we engage in a community and stakeholder engaged process. We interviewed AYE cancer survivors themselves uh, asking for their input, the and potential helpfulness of the client of the content. So here are just some of the screenshots of the storyline throughout the sessions. As Billy, the main character, the blue the blue balloon, uh, retrospectively walking the user through their experiences of overcoming depression. As briefly mentioned earlier. A notable innovation of the program includes a cliffhanger effect. Um, just to give you an example, in session six, the storyline ended with Billy the balloon debating whether she should take up an offer to meet with her just reunited high school sweetheart Johnny at the diner, but still haven't heard back from the text that she sent Johnny earlier. And that's the end scene of that session naturally, uh, the users would need to come back to session seven to figure out what happened to Billy. Did Billy go? Did Billy not go? So that's what we were thinking about the cliffhanger. And, and, and that is an effect that occurs in most of the sessions. In addition, we also made major tailoring of visual materials, motivational quotes, and CBT-related examples throughout the sessions to better reflect the program's relevance to a population that has cancer and are younger. And as you can see, we were also mindful in ensuring those materials that are inclusive of different identities to the best of our abilities. Most importantly, we were very intentional in integrating cancer-related content into the TCBT component, um, such as behavior activation. Just give you an example. The screenshot on the lower left side is a tailored educational panel doing brainstorm session with AYA survivors on potential activities for pleasurable and for achievement activities. Um, as you can see, we included some low intensity physical activities taking into account the likely physical limitations. And some of them are timely, some of them are more long-term during and after one's cancer treatment. And we also suggested cancer management as part of the activities for achievement to encourage users, AYE survivors, better health management behaviors. Finally, I just wanted to underscore kind of the full potential of the platform and it can be easily achieved for us to create more individualized platform materials 
such as an educational panel specifically designed for AYEs serving in the military with a diagnosis of lymphoma on the lower right side of the slide. And our team have recently submitted an R1 application to the Department of Defense proposing a military-specific AYE program. We were beyond grateful to receive the psychosocial grant from Julius Lexi of Hope uh, uh, Hero Fund through Symbotrix Foundation to conduct a pilot randomized control trial to evaluate the feasibility and preliminary efficacy of the MYTH program in reducing AYE cancer survivors' depressive symptoms. Using primarily a clinic-based recruitment strategy at Michigan Medicine in conjunction with um, community-based participant self-referral, we recruited participants between the age of 15 to 26 years old with a current cancer diagnosis and experienced moderate or greater depression. A participant can either uh, receive active curative treatment or within five years of post-treatment survivorship. And the exclusion criteria include if a participant is receiving end-of-life care or current currently experiencing acute mental health conditions such as active psychosis or at an elevated level of self-harm. Over, over a eight month period between September 2020 to April 2021, our team con contacted 49 potentially eligible participants. 20 of these participants were not interested in the study for various reasons such as identified not depressed, uh, or not interested in a computer-based program due to overexposure uh, to computer. And uh, in addition, 12 potential participants did not meet the study inclusion criteria, including nine with a, uh, a low level of depression. Two participants were receiving end-of-life care, and one participant reported history of suicide attempts over the past two months. Consequently, this study has resulted in 17 participants being randomized into the treatment arm and the control arm. So participants in the treatment arm received the MYTH program, which is an individual-based A-session TCBT delivered on a weekly basis. The participants were instructed to complete the program weekly, but they have up to 10 weeks to complete all eight sessions. Upon completion of each session, a master's level trained research assistant would follow up with a five to 10 minute checking phone call to reinforce session content and link specific session content with participants' cancer management. All research assistants were instructed not to provide additional therapy. We decided to add this clinician follow-up based on the best practice guideline of the literature, but the brevity of the clinical contact here is important because five to 10 minutes of, uh, of the interpersonal follow-up does not really uh, further uh, strain the mental health workforce uh, given the brevity of the content. Similarly, participants in the control arm received an existing TCBT program beating the blues, which is, as you can see, had very similar intensity and their frequency as the MYTH program. Uh, the other protocols were all identical with the treatment arm. The only difference is that the beating the blue is a rather academic and a text heavy generic version for depression, and it does not um, have cancer specific tailoring for the, for the participants. So we evaluated um, the feasibility, acceptability, and participants' clinical improvement using well-established and psychometrically validated scales. Given the constraint of time, I just wanted to highlight some of the key findings here. First, 80% of the participants in the experimental arm achieved the feasibility endpoint evidenced by completing six out of eight myth sessions versus in the control, the feasibility uh, endpoint was reached by 71.4% of the participants. There are two more nuanced pieces that I would like to share. Uh, six out of the eight participants in the experimental arm who achieved the feasibility endpoint completed all eight sessions, whereas only two participants in the control arm completed all eight sessions. And one participant in the, in the control condition reported the intervention not being helpful as a reason for dropout, whereas no, no participants cited this reason for the MYTH program. In terms of the treatment and efficacy, participants in both groups reported a statistically significant reduction in depressive symptom measured by the PHQ-9 scale, but it's worth noting that the between group effect size was large in its magnitude, meaning participants receiving the myth intervention reported significantly and clinically greater reduction in depressive symptoms than their counterparts in the control arm. Additionally, it was encouraging for us to observe that participants in the experimental arm reported a statistically significant reduction in anxiety as measured by GAD7, but not in the control condition. 
some key strengths that we learned from the participants about the platform. The first is that participants really liked the cliffhanger effect and they found it very effective to engage them to come back to the sessions. Several participants also considered the program as a valuable mental health treatment option that can be embedded or integrated into their cancer care, especially for those who are doing outpatient chemo or infusion where they probably don't have other things to do and they think this can be a good way to keep them distracted, but also to learn something about CBT and their depression. All participants appreciated the privacy and the safety of receiving CBT remotely, and many participants praised the tailored content being medically relevant, and their experiences are, uh, uh, and uh, and the, the they they found that the platform aesthetically attractive to them. A couple of key um, kind of learning lessons learned. Uh, unanimously, participants wish that Billy uh, herself is a cancer survivor because currently we really uh, we need to develop an entirely new storyline to make that uh, feasible. And uh, our team are really working hard to uh, to obtain external funding to make that possible. Uh, they also recommended uh, uh, having integrative homeworks uh, to having uh, homework centers to have a cell phone based application to facilitate CB to facilitate CBT homeworks that allow a linkage with their mobile notifications or calendars and a system integration with their current cancer care between the program and their current uh, current medical facility. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators from UM School of Social Work and Michigan Medicine, and, and again uh, the generous. Uh, Support from Julius Lexi of Hope uh, Hero Fund from Symbotrix for funding this study. And I would like to end with this quote, which was actually uh, Julia's favorite quote, which says, you never know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice you have. One of the greatest privileges of the job that I have and the research I do is witnessing the never lasting strengths, uh, resilience and um, everlasting strengths and resilience and hope from those who are battling with cancer at a younger age. They have been a constant source for my own strengths and motivation. And I thank them very much for that. And I thank you for listening. Terrific. Thank you so much uh, now. And uh, sorry, I had to, sorry, I cut Brad off with the technical stuff. He will be uh, present, of course, for the question and answers. Uh, I need to turn now uh, a great opportunity to sum up these talks and give some uh, messages of her own. Dr. Jamie Mitchell is our discussant. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Um, what a wonderful set of panelists and presentations. So I just have a few concluding remarks. All of the innovative programs of research uh, that we just heard about today are reaching populations that are understudied, underserved, and or disproportionately overburdened by chronic conditions and health needs, such as diabetes in Black men with Dr. Hawkins, enhancing HIV and STI testing among youth with Dr. Cordova, um, mental health among adolescent and young adult cancer survivors with Dr. Zhang, and psychosocial and supportive cancer care with Dr. Zebrak. Each of these presentations demonstrates the future of social work research, specifically how, as our social work grand challenges state, we can leverage the power of technology for social good. For example, Dr. Cordova is at the forefront of using developmentally and culturally tailored technology-based preventive interventions, in this case, a mobile app, to reach youth. Clearly, Dr. Cordova understands how this intervention can help clinicians flag risky behaviors, and then how this technology can also provide direct feedback to clinicians to improve the interventions they deliver and the linkages that clinicians can provide to services in the local community. Further, Dr. Zhang is advancing the science of reaching adolescent and young adult survivors of cancer who are experiencing depression. And he's reaching this population with fun, engaging, developmentally appropriate and well-tailored interventions. As with all of our incredible social work sciences, he's using a person and environment approach that integrates specific knowledge of the cancer experience into the intervention to make it more meaningful and efficacious for those that it's designed to serve. We also saw a common theme of cognitive behavioral therapy as an intervention across multiple presentations today. This signals to me that our social work researchers, such as Dr. Jackie Hawkins, are ensuring that interventions designed to tackle persistent health disparities, particularly in communities of color, 
are using holistic approaches that bring together the best available science in addressing physical health and mental health concurrently. It's so incredibly gratifying to see examples of rigorous scientific interventions that are actually designed for real people with real problems, and not only abstract interventions designed for only ideal laboratory condi con conditions. For example, Dr. Zebrak illuminated how cancer is experienced as trauma, impacting the psychological functioning of individuals and families and producing harmful chronic stress over time. His work gives us a hopeful glimpse into the future of social work research, where social work scientists are working actively alongside basic and medical scientists to apply precision, precision medicine to predict or identify individuals who may most benefit from certain targeted therapies to improve both cancer outcomes and psychosocial and supportive cancer care. Dr. Zebrak's research on the emerging area of social genomics, or how social conditions in the environment literally get under the skin to affect health outcomes and disparities, nicely ties together an underlying thread among all of the panelists. Each of these panelists are addressing social conditions in physical and mental health and the integration of both that are powerful factors such as stress, sexual health, exercise, mental health that shape opportunities for health and longevity, particularly amongst vulnerable or underrepresented populations. These are also factors that shape longevity and well being across the lifespan. We are so fortunate to have such a wealth of scholars doing this work in this school of social work at this time. The research, collaboration, and innovation that our panelists displayed, and that really is indicative of our entire faculty and staff in the School of Social Work, is an excellent representation, not only of the previous 100 years of work that we have achieved, but also it's a peek into the future of where social work science is headed for the next 100 years to come. Thank you. All right, we're gonna be moving into our Q&A portion now. So Jamie, you should see some questions um, in the chat or in the Q&A. Let's go ahead and prioritize those. And then when you run out, I can send you the ones that came through from the chat. Okay, wonderful. Can you get us started just so I'm not uh, clicking around? <laughs> you bet. All right, so our first question is actually for Brad. Um, did you also look at parents of youth and their trauma reactions? I have not in, in my own work, um, although it would certainly make sense to, to acknowledge people within the context of their families. Uh, there is a pretty sizable body of research um, around the experience of caregivers, of loved ones, uh, uh, of folks who are experiencing not just cancer, but other, other chronic conditions. Um, you know, just to, to give you a brief, you know, picture of what this, what this often looks like, um, you know, our, our current system of care um, excuses folks from a healthcare system very quickly. You have cancer patients who are going home with ports um, and they're told to keep those those ports, those catheters, cleans for the for their repeat visits to the to the cancer center for their chemotherapy, and 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 oftentimes it's the the spouse, the partner, the significant other of the cancer patient who receives either an implicit or explicit message about how you have to keep this catheter clean so that your your loved one doesn't get an infection. Um, and have to come back to the hospital. I mean, just imagine how stressful and scary that must be uh, for a family member to be to be told that. So I think the question is on target. Personally, my own work hasn't hasn't focused on that that question, but I, there, there are folks out there who are doing that work. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, there's another question here in the Q&A regarding the cancer presentation, and I think this actually could go to both Dr. Zebrecht and Dr. Zhang. Um, with the prevalence of cancer skyrocketing and even more so in the years to come, uh, this uh, attendee is wondering why insurance companies may make it more difficult to get certain screenings for specific cancers 
to jump through hoops or meet certain age requirements, um, even if the age of onset for some of these cancers may be decreasing. Do either of you have any insight into that? Cancer is cancer, treatment is business. Um, and the financers of cancer care and healthcare in general, just like any other business, any other corporation are looking to um, minimize financial risk and maximize profit. Very succinct. There's actually a related question, um, and that is uh, directed toward Dr. Zhang. And that is, um, in addition to the shortage of mental health providers, does lack of or type of insurance potentially impact access to CBT treatment, and how so? It does, and I think that's such a great and an important question. Um, just a story to share. While we're doing this study, we're doing uh, CBT for AYA cancers. We've been approached by younger uh, uh, parents of younger uh, cancer patients and survivors and an older, and they all reach out to us to the study just because that at that time they didn't have the insurance to cover uh, their mental health services. And they were unfortunately desperate at a time and just want to find anything that can be supportive to them. Um, so I think that's just an attestment to this great question that uh, insurance status does uh, significantly impact the access um, and I, if I may just quickly add, I, I think it, it also speaks to the importance of having social work researchers doing interventional research, because uh, I think I, it's, it's fair to, to say on behalf of all my colleagues that we also think from a social justice lens and health equity lens when we're thinking about treatment and access as we're developing this. So I think, you know, as we further grow into uh, the field as a profession in terms of the technology assisted intervention, we may be able to move the needle a little bit. Wonderful. There's another question about whether, uh, essentially, what is the literature base or, well, you know, are there any studies on the benefits of support groups for any of these populations? And so I think we're hearing a lot about technology assisted interventions, um, but support groups still seems to be a tried and true potential intervention. Would anyone like to speak to that in any of the populations that we heard about today? In, in terms of, of cancer support groups, I think the, um, uh, you know, the empirical studies have showed that support groups have a, um, a moderate effect. Um, but I think in, you know, what, you're, what you're seeing in those studies is, is an average, uh, that for some people, support groups are critical to their mental health and their, their survival and their adaptability while dealing with cancer. Uh, there are other folks who they're, you know, they're attending really doesn't have any uh, measurable effect at all. So you get the average, um, which comes back to the point that I was trying to make around precision medicine. You know, there are a lot of uh, therapeutic uh, psychosocial modalities out there. And I think our challenge ahead is to get folks matched up with the treatment modality that is most likely to benefit them in a personal way. Wonderful. And Dr. Hawkins, I know that you're, it's not the study you presented today, but you have done uh, quite a bit of work on peer interventions. Um, and so not traditionally support group, but certainly um, interventions that utilize peers. Um, can you illuminate any of the, the work that you've done or research that you know about in that area? Um, yeah. So actually we do call them support groups, <laughs> but they're, they are very specific to diabetes self-management. So they're diabetes self-management support groups. And the other um, work that I do, I was part of a project called Praise um, that was done in 21 churches in Flint, um, Toledo in Detroit. And we trained peer leaders, so folks from the community to run the support groups. Um, and the way that they run them is, you know, whatever issues come up. So it's not a scripted or lecture style, it's more of a dialogue. And the great thing, um, that happened from those support groups uh, with the peer leaders is that people were able to learn from each other. It really normalized the stigma that can sometimes come up around um, having diabetes and the different issues uh, that folks face. Um, it, support groups are a really powerful tool. And 
I'll say for the work that I do, we are um, focused on doing those types of support groups and training through leaders specifically for men. And I found that there are some issues, I apologize, my dog is, <laughs> there are some issues that are specific to men um, that, that come up um, specifically uh, in these groups that didn't come up in the, the groups with men and women. Fantastic. And Dr. Cordova, I want to pull you into the chat as well. Have you done work or are you aware of work that utilizes the power of peer support and some of the work that you're doing in sexual health with, um, with youth? Yeah, so actually it's interesting. We, uh, we actually had some pilot funding to have uh, peers deliver the intervention um, as opposed to clinicians. And so we had put that during the, the COVID, uh, we put that on pause but um, we're now starting to resume that. And so um, we're now laying the foundation for that as a way to see if, um, if there's any preliminary efficacy, uh, feasibility, acceptability with having peers deliver the intervention. Wonderful. It sounds like there's a lot of literature and a lot of research even being done within these projects in the peer space. I wanna to return to you, Dr. Zhang. There's several questions in the chat about the next directions for your research as well as uh, whether some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, there was one question about whether uh, in your work, uh, did it include or exclude patients that were initially diagnosed as pediatric patients? And then relatedly, um, are you at all concerned about uh, a relatively low sample size in this initial work? Thank you for these great questions. I also saw one uh, ask about the cliffhanger effect. I do want to give credit to both Joe Hamley and Natty Weaver, both the, the co-developers of the program. Um, and with regard to the low level of participation, I am at this moment not as concerned uh, because of the timeline. As you can see, we started around October 2020 and then clearly COVID. Uh, during the during the COVID, um, and then that's that's the majority of our period of time. So both the CS Ma Children's Hospital and Rogel Cancer Center were strictly shut down, which has impacted our recruitment. And just based on our actual recruitment phase, we were very pleased to see the level of responses, the clinical referrals that we got. So I'm not as concerned about the the low number of um, uh, inclusion. And with regard to future directions. Um, I think the next step is really my, my dream is to have a cancer-specific storyline. And, and I think the platform itself is so powerful. Um, the main character doesn't have a cancer diagnosis. And then I would hope that I would have a cancer-specific storyline. And then that platform would allow future teams, not just our team, but future teams who wanted to specialize, for example, in prostate cancer to develop their own story or breast cancer to develop their own story, which I think is highly feasible. Um, and I think I answered all the questions, right? Carter? Yeah, there, absolutely. Okay. Thank oh. you. Um, I want to bring it back to Dr. Hawkins as we run out of time here. There's a couple of questions in the chat specifically about what CBT looks like in some of these interventions and any good re uh, resources or recommendations you can provide for folks to learn more. And actually anyone can answer. I just wanted to make sure that Dr. Hawkins had an opportunity to address her work as well. Well, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and let someone else answer though. Um, we have, uh, CBT is something that I... Um, and just beginning to work on. And so um, I also want to say that uh, like Dr. Zhang and other folks um, who've been doing this work much longer, uh, it would be maybe a better idea for, in terms of resources, that question, I'm not sure about too, like Washington County or. Um, yeah, any of the other panelists, feel free to jump in. And I want to specify, it did say TCBT. Okay, yeah. So, so I can chime in quickly. Um, my impression, and I'm pretty sure because CBT often is a, um, in my view, too widely utilized uh, a, a term. And so when I, every time talk about CBT specifically, I would, as I was emphasizing in the presentation, it needs to be adhered to the core components because that we know that's what 
it's the most effective aspect of CBT. So what it looks like, it, it should, at least in principle or in spirit, include those three components. I think a lot of the variations and innovations comes to the delivery of those core components into the targeted population, which I think does require some uh, a lot more research with regard to the specific populations. And with regard to resources, I think um, there are a lot of entry level, even just online um, websites to start read about CBT. The uh, Academy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy can be a good resource, and the Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy can be another good uh, source to start with. Fantastic. And I'll close out uh, the questions with you, Dr. Hawkins. And that is, um, you, uh, there's a question that says, do you think that having African-American men participate by leading uh, in providing information and support is a strategy to keep them more engaged or more fully engaged? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the issue isn't necessarily, um, I think there's a misconception that um, the research sometimes perpetuates with um, African-American men with chronic illnesses is that, you know, they're they're not engaged in their care. They, um, for whatever reason, don't care about taking care of themselves or going to the doctor, um, when really they face real barriers uh, to getting to the doctor in the first place and participating in programs like this. So absolutely getting them together is really wonderful to see um, all of the amazing things that they share, how engaged they are and how they support each other. Um, the issue really in programs like these is finding them in the first place, and then thinking about how we can remove the barriers to get them to stay in a program long-term. And uh, certainly one of those strategies is to get them in a group with folks who have similar experiences, who are talking about things that are relevant to them. Um, what I will say is the tra traditional diabetes self-management education that's delivered by a certified diabetes educator is typically in a um, lecture style format. And there's some ridiculous number where folks go to the first session and about 90% of people don't come back. Um, and so we clearly need to rethink how we're engaging folks. Absolutely, that's a great point. Do any of the panelists have any final thoughts before we turn it back over to Emma? No? Well, thank you everyone. And Emma, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, I think Joe might have a few comments to close this out. I'm going to add him to the screen right now. Oops, I didn't. That's okay. But anyway, uh, just thanks to everyone and to Emma for organizing this and uh, super excited to see all this amazing work and uh, great talks, inspirational work here at the School of Social Work. And thanks to everyone for attending uh, this second in the series of three talks on uh, intervention research, which there's plenty of great stuff happening here at the school. So thanks so much for attending. Great, thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. Happy birthday, School of Social Work.